So um, yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the NC Space Grant for making this virtual Astronomy Days a real thing that we were able to do. And thank you to our special presenter, Matt Funk, a social, sorry, not a social, a solar system ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> a social system ambassador. That no, a solar system amb ambassador for NASA and um, JPL. And Matt, before you really get started, can you maybe tell us what that actually means? Like oh, what sure. is a solar system sure. ambassador? Uh, back in the early days of the space program, of course, it was very common for space stuff to make the news regularly and for people to know what was going on at any moment. Uh, since then, space hasn't been in much in the news as much, but uh, we're still interested in telling people what we're doing in space because we're still trying to do new things all the time. Uh, so NASA and Jet Propulsion Labs, which oversee uh, everything that NASA does that is unmanned, uh, put together this volunteer uh, educational research, uh, I'm sorry, outreach program. Uh, and they train people remotely to uh, be able to share what it is that the space program is doing. And hopefully, you know, so we don't uh, have to guess or try to make things up. They let us know exactly which missions are going and what they hope to accomplish and why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, we also want to basically educate people about how space flight works. And that's what this presentation is supposed to be about. Um, I want to go into how we make stuff get from one place to another in space without hopefully throwing in too much technical detail or too much math, you know, just keep it approachable and uh, hopefully get some really good and interesting questions out there. If people still need more information or if people see a connection that they had made before, whatever it is, I'd love to hear what, uh, what you have to say. Um, this, which I have on my screen here is an artistic depiction or an attempt to draw uh, the idea of travel lanes through the solar system. Um, it's true that you do get certain opportunities where it's better to launch than others. You may have heard of launch windows and that's what they refer to. Periods of time where if you aim in just the right direction, it's actually easier to get to your destination than at other times. It's a very difficult thing to put into an artistic depiction. <laughs> so this doesn't necessarily do a good job, but it's, I don't know. The point of art isn't necessarily to show the um, actual appearance of things so much as how things feel sometimes. And I think that's what the artist was trying to get at. Uh, now, when it comes to actually aiming things in the solar system, I don't know if any of you have ever been through one of the walking solar systems, or even in, in the state of Maine, I believe they have one you can drive through. Uh, but most of the depictions of the solar system you see in books uh, we'll have a little note saying that, you know, okay, the planets are to scale, but the distances aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because we call space space because it's mostly that. It's mostly empty and enormously empty. Uh, in the one in the state I grew up in, in New Hampshire, they gave out planets that were in um, little plastic Easter eggs you know, so they wouldn't get lost. And I say that because Earth itself was only uh, about the size of a, of a grain of sand, right? So you had to be very, very careful with these things. Um, and you could walk from the sun, which was, you know, not uh, only about uh, a yard across and painted in the window of a planetarium, uh, out to Pluto, which was a quarter of a mile away on that scale. And most of the rest of that is just little specks dotting the landscape and the rest of it is empty space. Right. So when you hear something like we've put two rovers on Mars or whatever, uh, I think the assumption that a lot of people come back with is, well, of course we've put rovers on Mars. That's something we can do, but you don't realize how small the targets are that you're aiming for and how difficult it is to do that. So how do we get to where we want to go in all this empty space? That story uh, is going to start with Isaac Newton. Right? He was a, a physicist who came up with some rules um, a few hundred years ago and kind of changed how we look at everything. He broke down the way everything moves down to just three rules. Right? Uh, I, oh, there we go. It is switching. Thank you. Rule number one, things that aren't moving won't move on their own. And things that are moving can't change their speed or their direction on their own, right? That means if you want to change the direction or the speed of something, you have to figure out a way to give it a push or a pull. And that absolutely amazed people when Isaac Newton said it. Because before that, the guy who had kind of described motion uh, was Aristotle. And he his rules had held sway for nearly 2,000 years. And he argued that when things are moving, they want to stop. 
And that seems to fit with our everyday experience, right? You throw a ball, it bounces a few times and eventually it stops, right? So everything we see that's in motion eventually comes to a stop and it all makes intuitive sense. But what Isaac Newton realized is that it's not that everything wants to stop, it's that everything we see is being pulled or pushed somehow. So he, uh, he discovered gravity 20 years before he published this stuff. And between that and friction, like the ball rubbing through the air or rubbing along the ground as it bounces or whatever, uh, things that we see here on Earth will stop eventually. Things that are, it doesn't have the chance to keep going all by itself. But in space, there's very, very close to no friction at all. And you don't feel the effects of gravity. Um, there is gravity and it will change your path. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, the rules seem to be different up there because things don't just naturally come to a stop. Uh, Isaac Newton's second rule, <laughs> for some reason, the animations aren't working between the slides. These things are supposed to twirl and look nice. Um, <laughs> it looks well, great to us anyway. Okay, well, cool. I'll just imagine a twirl. <laughs> All right, just imagine things things looking nifty here. Uh, acceleration, see, science likes to use fancy words for things uh, so that everybody knows what everybody's talking about when they describe something. Acceleration is a change in speed or direction. And the amount of change depends on the amount of force. And this makes things really, really simple. If you want to change something's speed or direction a tiny bit, you only need to push it or pull it a tiny bit. If you want to change it twice as much, you need to push it or pull it twice as hard. Uh, this takes out a lot of guesswork, right? So that we don't have to just guess where that ball is going to end up when we throw it. We can predict exactly where it's going to end up based on how far, how hard we throw it. Uh, and finally, rule number three, forces come in pairs. That force is that push or that pull. So for every push in one direction, there's an equal push in the opposite direction. And this really helps us with rockets. This is the key to how rockets work. Uh, a lot of questions I get when it comes to the space travel is how do space rockets move anywhere when there's nothing for them to push against? And that's a very good question. When we think about pe things moving on the earth, like when we go for a walk, we push against the ground or, or tires on a car pushing against the ground as it rolls, but a rocket doesn't push against anything. Even an airplane, you can imagine the propeller grabbing the air and shoving it behind it. What does the rocket push against in order to move? Um, so in a sense, the rocket is pushing against its own propellant. And I'm gonna try to explain how that works. Right. If you imagine, this is Sarah, by the way, if you imagine Sarah here uh, under two different circumstances where she's on a, a cart that rolls, right? And she either has one big ball or a few bean bags that weigh a fraction as much, right? If she pushes that now, oh, the animation isn't going to work here, is it? No, it isn't. Nuts. <laughs> well, if she just, it, I'm going to have to ask you to imagine here, and this will probably appeal to your intuition. Uh, if she shoves the big ball as hard, as hard as she can, she's going to end up with one big push and the cart is going to scoot in the opposite direction, right? But if she pushes out the little bean bag, the cart will still scoot, but not as fast or as far with each bean bag. The thing is that if she throws a lot of bean bags, if she ends up throwing a weight of bean bags equal to, equal to the big ball, she'll end up going a little bit faster than she would have with the ball alone. And that's because uh, she's adding to her speed every time she throws. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it actually works. So if, if just throwing things out the back end makes you scoot off in the opposite direction, rockets do exactly the same thing. Instead of little tiny bean bags, you can think of them throwing out molecules of propellant out the back end. The gases that escape out the back end of the rocket in it, they kick out one direction and the rest of the rocket scoots off in the other. It's just that there are millions and millions and millions of them and they're moving very, very, very fast. So it actually changes the rocket's speed in a way that can be noticed. Right, the and does that uh, work with any moving object? You know, like it's easy to imagine um, uh, someone being on a scooter and like throwing mm -hmm. these fairly lightweight, you know, bean bags would still push them back up like inch by inch by inch. But would that work with larger objects? Sure. Even in sure. even here on Earth? Well, here on Earth, uh, we have friction with the ground, right? Gotcha. So mm -hmm. if you're just standing there and you're throwing bean bags in some direction, if it's not enough to overcome your friction with the ground, you're not going to go anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Okay. But in space, there's none of that friction. Everything that gets thrown out uh, 
if there's enough of a force, of course, it'll move you regardless. But everything that gets thrown out the back will cause that kick in the opposite direction, even if the, the balls you're throwing or the beanbags you're throwing are very, very, very tiny. Um, and Kelly has a question really quickly about that. Sure, um, sure. If Sarah were to come to a halt between each beanbag, how would the distance covered compare to the larger ball that she's throwing? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, you'd have to know how much friction there is in the cart. If there were no friction in the cart, she would. the distance covered would be exactly the same, whether she threw one bean bag or a very big ball or any number of things. She'd travel an infinite distance wow. because there'd be nothing to slow her down. Remember, we go back to the first rule here that things don't change speed on their own. It has There has to be something like friction to make you stop or throwing a bean bag in the opposite direction. Right? If you can create an equal push in the opposite direction, you'll go back down to zero. Your speed will, will cancel out. Right. So it's a very good question, but yeah. I'd have to know how much friction there is in the cart to be able to answer that. And I don't know that, unfortunately. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see. If <laughs> Again, this was supposed to be animated, and this isn't working very well. But if things move in a straight line, like we've talked about, all on their own, uh, how is it that we end up with something like an orbit, right? This this space shuttle is supposed to be spinning around a little Earth here. Um, and that's obviously a curved path. If things move in a straight line, unless something makes them not do that, unless there's some kind of force on them, what is it that keeps the rocket moving in a circle? I'm going to ask. Right. Oh, Anastasia says the gravity of the Earth. The gravity of the Earth, yes, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, it's when we say that astronauts are in free fall, uh, we try to we try to be careful to say that they are experiencing uh, not experiencing the effects of gravity. In fact, the amount of gravity holding the spacecraft in orbit and bending its path into a circle is almost as strong as the amount of gravity you feel sitting on, sur on the surface of the Earth. It's just that when you're in the spacecraft and everything's falling at the same speed, you don't feel any of that. It's like being in an elevator that's where, you know, the, ca the cables are cut or something and it starts plummeting towards the earth, you'd float in the middle of that elevator for as long as it fell. Um, because you and the elevator and everything would all be falling at the same speed. That's that's very counterintuitive, but um, it's actually gravity that burn that, that keeps the, uh, the rocket in its orbit. Uh, in fact, the ISS, if you want to uh, try to imagine the scale of this, uh, the International Space Station, um, only orbits about 400 kilometers up or about 250 miles up. Uh, on a, the scale of a 12 inch globe, that's only about three eighths of an inch off the surface. Right, so it just skims up there, spinning around in a circle, experiencing uh, pretty much the same gravitational conditions that we do here on Earth. All right, now this next slide is an illustration that Isaac Newton himself made. It's a, it's a copy of that illustration. It's not the, the actual illustration itself. It's cleaned up a little bit so you can see letters and so on more cleanly, but it kind of tries to illustrate how orbits work, right? He imagined a big cannon on top of a big mountain here and firing, that can, firing the cannon uh, with different amounts of gunpowder. And the more gunpowder you pack in, the faster the cannonball leaves that cannon, right? So just a little bit of gunpowder and you see it, it follows a path kind of like A, where it just kind of droops out, plop. You know, what if you fired it a little bit harder? Well, it would travel a little bit further. And more importantly, the curvature of the Earth means it would travel even further than you might expect. If the Earth curves away from as, as it goes. If you fire it at just the right speed, you could actually have it fall down and move forward, it, move forward at the right speed so that the Earth curves away from it before it can ever hit. And that's exactly what an orbit is. It's moving sideways at just the right speed that the Earth curves away from it before it can fall down. Um, so it, if you fire it with a little, a little bit more energy than that, it will swing out even further from the earth before it decides to fall down. That's E, uh, I'm sorry, that's D. And with E, you fire it with enough force that it leaves the earth entirely. Uh, the earth's gravity will continue to slow it down as it moves out, but the earth's gravity also gets weaker and weaker as you go away. So it will, it will get slower and slower, but it will never actually turn around and fall back down. They call that escape velocity. And if you leave Earth at that speed or faster, you're never coming back unless you throw beanbags in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
And um, quick question before you move on. Um, Anastasia had another question. The zero G effect, is that a result of essentially a free fall? Um, yes. If, if by zero G effect, you mean the kind of zero G effect you would feel in an elevator if, if someone cut the cables mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, in NASA, at NASA, they have a jumbo jet where they've taken all the seats out and they fly it, um, kind of dive it down towards the earth at the speed that gravity would pull you down. So the, the plane and the people inside it and everything are all falling at the same speed. And it, it's, it's the same kind of thing. You get zero G effects inside that plane. I can only do it for about 30 seconds at a time because they have to eventually pull the plane up so it doesn't hit the ground. But um, it's exactly the same sort of thing. When you get the plane and the uh, the or whatever you're riding, a rocket or whatever, and the people in it moving at the same speed, you don't feel the effects of gravity. Whether you're falling or you're out in deep space where there's no uh, gravitational objects nearby, as long as you're moving at the same speed, you're you're you feel no gravitational effects. Wow. It's weird. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a lot of fun. I mean, I've never gotten to try it myself, but uh, I've seen videos and the people are smiling pretty big. So, you know, <laughs> I have to believe it, that they love it. Hmm? Is that what we sometimes call the vomit comet? Yes. Yes, that's a nickname <laughs> for it. The, the KC-135 jet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's a good job, Benji Tater. Yeah. They, uh, it, they got that, that nickname there. <laughs> there you go. They say that about half of astronauts... Um, get sick they get motion sick because your the your ears your inner ears i mean the part of your ear that's inside your skull um actually detects what direction your head is pointed in and it depends on gravity to do that uh, in space of course those the little bones that float around inside the inner ear and say your head is pointed in this direction are free, free to go any which way so your ear and your eyes are telling you that your head is pointed in very different directions and uh well that's the kind of thing that tends to make people motion sick. So they try to screen it out as best they can. But even so, about half of astronauts, when they get up there, uh, find it a little bit too much to deal with. Yeah. Uh, it usually passes after a few hours. But it'd be nice if we could figure out a really good test to figure out who gets sick and who doesn't and, and give them motion sickness pills ahead of time. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, putting them through the trials of the vomit comet. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, OK, sorry. I don't see any other questions. So go ahead. That's fine. And that's fine. Now, when, when things leave the Earth, they still continue to follow a curved path. And I'm going to ask if people know why. We don't right. fly, if we want to go to Mars, we don't fly in a straight line. Do you know why? All right, let's see. I'm waiting for some responses. Does anyone know why we don't just travel in a straight line? Um, hmm. The awesome Emmett says, so that you can attach to Mars gravity. I think that's that's our goal, right? That's our goal, yeah. You want to get to get under Mars gravity when you get there. But even just as you leave the Earth, you don't want to, you don't want to go in a straight line to Mars. Uh, Chris says Mars is revolving around the sun. Mm, yeah, and they're on the right track. Closer, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, because of Earth's gravity, we would never catch up because the target is moving. The target is moving. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, this was supposed to be animated, too. See, there'd be this nice little sun floating in, then it would draw Earth's orbit. Okay, Earth's orbit here is shown in blue around the sun. Whoops. And I just, I sorry about that. I just moved that little thing, and I didn't mean to. Um, we want to leave Earth and get to Mars when Mars happens to be where we're aiming at it, right? Mars could be anywhere in this circle. This is Mars orbit out here. So what we do is we give it a push and it's still controlled by the sun's gravity the entire time. So it follows a curved path around the sun in exactly the way that that cannonball followed a curved path around the earth when we kicked it harder and harder, right? We, kick, we give it an extra kick to push it out towards the orbit of Mars, just like in illustration D here and meet up with Mars when it gets there. Now the timing has to be just right to make this work, obviously. We get this, we get opportunities like this about once every two years. And the trip is a half an orbit, right? But it takes longer than half an orbit of Earth, which is about a year, uh, half a year, because <laughs> you know it goes around the sun once every year. And it takes less time than half an orbit of Mars. Mars takes about uh, two and a half years to go around the sun. So this this takes between half a year and one and three quarter years. It, it ends up taking about seven to nine months, depending on uh, how things line up. And I say that because actually these orbits aren't circles. Mars orbit is very oval. 
it swings in close and then goes further away. Uh, you could actually notice its ovalness if I had an actual accurate diagram here, but this gives you an idea of the timing you need to catch up with Mars, right? Uh, when you get to Mars, you actually need to match speed with Mars or you're going to fall right back down, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you need a push here and a put you need at Earth's orbit and you need to push at Mars's orbit. Everything about getting to where you want to go in space is about matching speed. Right? So when we talk about the range of a rocket, we could use the amount it can change its speed to get to somewhere else. It doesn't make much sense to talk about it in terms of how many miles it can go. Because like we said, if there's no friction, you could give it a push and it would just go forever. But uh, it, there's only a certain amount you can change the speed based on the amount of rocket fuel you have. So when you talk about the range of a rocket, you'll often hear about it discussed in terms of miles per hour or meters per second. And that's weird to think about range that way, but that's how uh, space is kind of a weird place to operate in. Right. Now, uh, there's one last uh, one other thing I want to mention, and you may have heard about it. Uh, another trick to get to outer space uh, and, and things further than Jupiter, especially uh, our rocket engines are only about as good to get to Ju as only good enough to get to Jupiter on their own uh, is something called the slingshot maneuver. Uh, you may have heard that but used before where the rocket will actually use some of the energy of a planet to boost its speed. And I'll try to show a little bit about how that works, right? It seems kind of counterintuitive, but let's say you have Jupiter here. Um, you could draw an imaginary circle around Jupiter. Now, if the, there were no rocket engines going on at all, you'd expect that the rocket would, at whatever circle you want to draw, it can be any altitude above Jupiter, but any circle you want to draw, you'd expect that the rocket would be moving at the same speed as it came in as when it went out because no energy is being spent no attempt is being made to change its speed. All you've got to worry about here is the, the gravity of Jupiter and gravity should speed it up on the way in and slow it down on the way out. It should be exactly the same speed on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, that, that would seem to be the, uh, the intuitive way to understand it. But th what we have to remember is that Jupiter is in motion, right? This green arrow is supposed to show the direction of Jupiter moving around the sun. The circle is so big that it's almost flat at this point when we're just as we're staring at Jupiter. So we'll just pretend that it's moving from left to right. Uh, if the rocket that we want to pick up speed comes up from behind Jupiter and gets slung off, then from the sun's point of view, it leaves faster than it came in. From Jupiter's point of view, it's, it's at the same speed when it comes in and when it goes out at whatever uh, altitude you want to pick. But some of Jupiter's speed around the sun gets sent into the spacecraft. Basically, Jupiter spends longer dragging the spacecraft behind it than letting it shoot off, um, shoot off when, when the spacecraft approaches from behind. And this also works in the opposite direction. If we want to slow the spacecraft down, we can send the spacecraft in front of Jupiter. And Jupiter will actually gain a little bit of speed and the spacecraft will lose speed. Jupiter is enormous, so the amount of speed it loses or gains in the transaction is very, very small. Uh, they, uh, they actually did the calculations back when a Voyager 2 was going to be using Jupiter to slingshot out to see the rest of the outer solar system. Um, and if you actually do the math, it works out that Jupiter slowed down on the order of one centimeter every trillion years. Wow. Uh, it didn't slow down much because Jupiter is massive. There were still picket signs, though, and people saying, you know, save Jupiter's orbit and whatever. Um, <laughs> and Matt, hey, um, sorry, did you want to add anything else about this? Because we have a few questions that you've oh, sure. with these fun facts. No, no, go, um, go ahead. First off, Michelle earlier um, had asked, are we using Earth as a slingshot when you're talking about the different gravity? But I'm seeing here we're using Jupiter as a, as a slingshot, right? Would you say that? Uh, I use Jupiter in my example, sure. And right, Jupiter okay. is probably used the most frequent, frequently because it's massive. Wow. It turns out that it's actually easier to get to Mercury by using Jupiter to slow the spacecraft down than it is by trying to slow down the spacecraft directly so that it falls in closer to the sun. So for the first few times we sent out probes to Mercury, we actually used Jupiter to slow the spacecraft down. Uh, to answer the other part of the question, yes, sometimes we do use Earth as a slingshot. There have been missions to, I want to say the Magellan mission to Venus and a few others, where rather than 
speed uh, remove all of the speed from the spacecraft all at once. We had it swing around the sun a few times, use, passing by Earth a few times as it went, and using slingshot maneuvers to uh, slow it down for us, rather than using rocket fuel to do it. Um, the important thing is that the, the thing you're slingshotting around is massive, and that it's moving in some useful direction. Mm -hmm. So that you can speed up or slow down with respect to the sun, if you're flying around in the solar system, uh, or whatever. It's all about matching speeds. Okay. Uh, something that might help because I know the slingshot maneuver is a little bit hard to wrap your head around. Um, it's it's like throwing a, a tennis ball at a train. Um, <laughs> which we've all done, right? Which we've all done, right? Because you know? <laughs> we're all troublemakers, right? Uh, don't, yeah, don't try this at home. If you throw the ball, let's say at 30 miles an hour, right? And this is a bullet train and it's moving at 300 miles an hour. Uh, and you, this train is coming at you, right? So it bounces off the front of the train. Um, from your point of view, the ball shoots off the front of the train at 630 miles an hour. At a, you know, that's about four fifths of the speed of sound. Um, it can't bounce off at 30 miles an hour uh, because uh, obviously the train is going much faster than that. It would catch up to the ball and the ball wouldn't go anywhere, but the ball bounces off much faster than it came in. From your point of view, from the train's point of view, the ball came in and left at 30 miles an hour. Wow, that is crazy. And it's because the train is moving from your point of view. That's, that's what these slingshot maneuvers are supposed to do. Are you picking up speed or are you losing it with respect to the sun? It doesn't matter about the, the, the planet you're using for energy. It will see you come in and leave at the same speed. Um, but with respect to the sun, this poor hapless person throwing tennis balls at trains, is it picking up or... or this is speeding up or slowing down. Um, similarly, if you threw a ball at the back of the train, assuming you could somehow catch up to it and threw the ball at the back of the train, uh, the ball would bounce back at you slower than you threw it. Uh, in actuality, if you want to be really technical about it, when you throw the ball at the front of the train coming at you, the train slows down a tiny bit <laughs> because it interacted with the tennis ball. You know, But it's very, very tiny because the train is massive. Wow. Um, I, I know, I don't want to, you know, go too off topic, but maybe yeah. really quickly, you can answer this with a yes or no. Mm -hmm. Would we hypothetically be able to use, um, energy from a black hole for space travel? For space travel? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that gets really tricky. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, black holes are weird. Okay. Um, yeah. I won't, I, I won't try to get into it too deep, but you know, obviously they're massive. So if it's moving in some direction that's useful to you, that's good. Uh, but the other weird thing about them is that if they rotate and you know, just about everything we come across in space rotates. So there's a good chance it does uh, space black holes are so massive that they drag space and time around with them as they spin. So if you go in the direction that the black hole is dragging space and time around with it, you'll actually gain extra speed from that. And, <laughs> that, uh, and that's, it's just nuts. Uh, but that's, that's, whew, we're not, we're not anywhere close to being able to use a black hole right now because we're still trying to make uh, things that can leave the solar system. <laughs> <laughs> and bla the black holes we know about are really stinking far away. Yeah. Um, now, All right. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Go sure. Ahead. Sure. Uh, when you get to your destination, right? Uh, here's the here's the Cassini probe breaking into orbit around Saturn. You have to fall into orbit around it. Otherwise, you're going to slingshot on by because again, you leave with the same amount of speed with which you entered, unless you do something to change that. So, anytime you you want to actually fall into orbit around something, like Cassini was in orbit around Saturn for years and years, um, you need to slow down. Unfortunately, from our point of view, you do that slowing down from behind the planet or behind the moon or whatever it is that you're, uh, you're trying to enter orbit around. And that can make for a few tense moments because you don't know whether you were successful at slowing down and actually entering orbit like you meant to do uh, until you pop around the other side and we can communicate with you again. Um, so there's, that's always a bit of tense moment in any space mission where we expect something to enter orbit. Uh, if you don't have rockets, though, and you want to try a different tactic, as we've been learning more and more about the atmospheres of other planets, we've been using the atmosphere to slow rockets down. That's a technique called aerobraking. Uh, this is the Mars Global Surveyor, and you can see how in different orbits it slowed down more and more and got further and further in, um, basically by plunging into Mars's atmosphere and generating friction with it. 
Uh, Mars is a little bit tricky if you want to actually like get to the surface or something like that. Uh, it has enough of an atmosphere to slow you down if you're a fast moving rocket, but it doesn't have enough of an atmosphere to slow you down to the point where you land gently, even if you use parachutes. Usually with, ro with space missions, it's one or the other. Use rockets to slow you down because there's no atmosphere or use a parachute to slow you down because, well, parachutes are easy and light. Um, but with Mars, unfortunately, there's not, no you have to do both. Uh, this is, let's see, the Mars Polar Lander, I believe, using um, rockets in the last phase of its mission to slow it down. And that's where I get to use the video player to show you how we landed a couple of times on Mars to try to come up with innovative solutions other than rockets to try to get us, uh, get us to land gently in the first place. All right, this first one is the Mars Exploration Rovers. Uh, some of us may remember Spirit and Opportunity. Those rovers that, uh, well, they lasted a long time. They were designed to last 90 days and they ended up lasting into the thousands of days. They were just phenomenally well-engineered robots. Uh, but you can see after it uses the, the atmosphere to slow down a little bit, it uses a parachute to try to slow it down somewhat. But that will only slow down to about Mach 5. Right, it's about five times the speed of sound. So you still need to slow down or come up with some inventive way to do that. And the way that they did it for Spirit and Opportunity was with airbags, right? We'll see that in just a minute. These airbags were made out of Kevlar so they wouldn't puncture too easily. Foomp, there we go. Um, <laughs> let's see, use the rockets to try to slow it down so that it'll bounce more or less gently. And then we let it bounce and roll to a stop. <laughs> it did that, it bounced for a few hours and then the airbags deflated and let the probe out. And uh, like I said, it worked phenomenally well. But if your rover is too heavy for that, as a uh, Curiosity rover is, and the Perseverance rover that's going to be landing on Mars uh, next month, you can't use these airbags. They would just pop, it's, these, the rovers are too heavy. So what can you use instead? And their solution there, I'm going to start this new video, was uh, a sky crane. And this to me is absolutely bonkers, right? <laughs> um, the idea is to use rockets to slow it down and the sky crane hovers, uh, uh, well, you'll see it soon enough, but the uh, this, if I can figure out a way to jump ahead a few minutes here. Uh, da -da -da. There we go. Let's just get to the good bit. Here it's using the atmosphere to slow it down. Now you can see computers have also advanced <laughs> from the time of Spirit and Opportunity to the time of this uh, of the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers. These, these videos are just much more pretty. And so is the landscape. Miranda said it's so amazing that they survived this. <laughs> and I Absolutely. And the thing is, they had, they had to do it. Boy, that's loud wind. They, they had to do it all on their own. You can't... I will have to wait, yes. Um, right, this sky crane picks a spot. And once it thinks it's found a good one, uh, it lowers the, ro the rover down by cables. Come on. <laughs> Here we go. And then when the rover touches, it snaps the cables. And the sky crane goes, flies off, and blows up somewhere because it's full of rocket fuel. Um, <laughs> But you get the idea that of lowering this thing down. You've got to be a little bit innovative when you try to land on Mars. Uh, we're probably going to have to come up with a different way still when we send humans there, because manned vehicles are going to have to carry not only our heavy selves, but all the air we need and, and the water and so on. Uh, and that's going to weigh a lot. Um, making a sky crane that could op operate under those kind of weights doesn't seem uh, easy to do, I guess. We've got a few technical challenges to try to conquer uh, before we think about doing that. Um, anyway, I've, there's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I mentioned aerobraking before. Uh, sometimes uh, 
exploratory vessels are designed to crash into their destinations. Uh, arrow breaking, of course, comes from the words arrow, meaning atmosphere, and breaking, meaning stopping. Um, crashing into the planet on purpose is sometimes referred to as litho breaking. Litho means rock, right? So <laughs> you just <laughs> slam into the rock and, and you've stopped. Um, so anyway, that about covers, I think, just about everything. Oh, no, wait, there was one more issue I wanted to try to try to get across. Um, this is an ion drive. Uh, someone asked about Dagobah earlier, a swamp planet. Um, Star Wars fans may recognize that TIE Fighter, TIE actually stands for Twin Ion Engine, and that sounds all science fiction-y and stuff and wonderful. But ion engines in real life are actually kind of weak. Um, this ion engine here, the Dawn probe to two asteroids in the solar system, Dawn and, uh, I'm sorry, Vesta and Ceres, uh, used three ion engines, and each one put out about as much force as a business card makes on your hand if you hold it in an open palm. Not very much at all, but it's super, super efficient with fuel. Unlike chemical rockets where they could burn for a few minutes at a time, uh, you can leave an ion engine for months at a stretch. And that means that you can slowly push your way out in a, in a widening spiral, right? This is a kind of diagram of that where um, Dawn left Earth and all the, all the places where it's light blue are where it was left on for weeks or months at a time. Used Mars for a gravity assist and continued to push out to Vesta. Stayed in orbit around Vesta for about a year and then left for Ceres. Ceres is the largest asteroid in the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, and stayed there for a number of months. Um, ion engines are kind of a new technology, but sometimes it takes thinking a little bit differently from the way that we have. All that's important, again, is matching speeds and any way you can come up with to do that uh, is pretty valuable, honestly, especially if it offers a, an advantage like an ion engine, which is, like I say, ridiculously efficient. Um, and that's about it. And Here's is that... Is New Horizons an ion engine? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, no. No, it used conventional chemical rockets to get out to Jupiter, used Jupiter for a gravity assist, and then it had huge maneuvering thrusters on it. And they were much bigger than usual because uh, that area of the solar system out by uh, by Pluto, has a whole bunch of icy bodies out at, uh, out there, kind of like asteroids, but instead of being made of rock, they're made of ices. Um, and we hoped we would be able to discover a different target out there for New Horizons to fly to after it finished investigating Pluto. Uh, and in fact, we did. It's a body we've called Ultima Thule. Um, it's about twice as far from the sun as Pluto is, and it looks like a snowman. Uh, two, <laughs> two balls stuck together, you know, just a big old space potato. Uh, but it was those big maneuvering thrusters that allowed us to push in that direction. It didn't use an ion, um, ion engines, but they're becoming more and more popular for uh, visiting asteroids because if we want to leave that asteroid, we don't have to push very hard. Asteroids don't have much gravity. Uh, so ion engines are kind of ideal just because they're so darn efficient. Uh, with, with New Horizons, it was just giving it a big push and then let it, letting Jupiter give it a big push and letting it coast the rest of the way. It's good to know. Um, we do have a few questions, Matt, if you still have time. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Really wrap it up. All right. Um, so let's see. Earlier in the program, we had someone ask, is Earth like planet TOI 700D? I and don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd have to look up TOI 700D. Okay. Right? Yeah, me too. So, um, so then we won't go to our follow-up question about that. Um, Tina wanted to know how long does it take for a satellite from Earth to get around Saturn, like once it is in Saturn's orbit? Hmm, boy. Well, <laughs> you didn't want me. <laughs> I was going to try to stay away from math, but I'll, uh, I'll stumble into it if I have to. Um, Saturn is about, are we, if we're assuming a straight direct transfer to Saturn, basically that half oval shape that I showed you before when we were going from uh, Earth to Mars. Let me see if I can look it back up here. There we go. Mm -hmm. If we did a direct transfer, only instead of going from Earth's orbit to Mars orbit, we went from Earth's orbit to Saturn's orbit, we'd have to go from uh, Earth's, the distance of Earth around the sun to about 10 times that distance. So we're talking about, um, the, the, the math for this actually wow. exists. You, what you do, if you really want to find this out, if you, uh, is you take the distance, it, huh, let me think. The 
distance cubed over the time it takes to go around squared is always one. Um, if you measure the if you measure the time if you measure the time it takes to get there in years, and the distance in in multiples of the Sun Earth distance, which they call an astronomical unit, uh, AU's. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I I, I could whip out a calculator time. and do it for you. Uh, it I could whip out a calculator and do it for you, but um, unfortunately, I'm not doing cubes and squares in my head very well these days. Um, <laughs> I didn't even try to do that. So <laughs> yeah, That's if I had to you. guess. Just, just guess at it. Uh, a direct transfer of uh, seven, seven and a half years. Wow. wow. It, it's faster if you borrow some speed from Jupiter, though, and that requires even more math. So <laughs> I'm not going to bore you with it. But um, yeah, that's another reason we use Jupiter is it actually gets you to your destinations faster. You can pick up speed from that planet. And and that's why we were using Jupiter as a um, you know a slingshot to get to Mercury, right? It was to to speed us up to make that trip faster it's tricky it's okay. tricky but it's to slow us down oh it is to slow. okay if you if you imagine earth spinning around the sun here if you want to fall in towards the sun you have to cancel all of earth's speed so you can fall in you have if you wanted to go to mercury which is also spinning around the sun here you'd have to cancel some of that speed so you could fall in closer it turns out that the amount of energy you speed to boost yourself out to Jupiter's orbit uh, and then fall back in is less than the amount of energy you would need to slow yourself down so that you'd fall into Mercury's orbit directly. Wow. So, so it's like it gets us there faster, but we're using it to slow down. It gets us there with less fuel. With less fuel, right. It right. takes more time. Yeah. But it, it, uh, it gets us there with less fuel. You have to change mm -hmm. the speed of your, uh, of your spacecraft with engines less. You let Jupiter do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, more efficient. That's great. Um, Alexander just asked, how long does it take to get to Kepler 22b from Earth? Hmm. Well, <laughs> if you want, I could pull up a web browser here and find out how far Kepler 22b is. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but let's see. 22b distance from Earth. It's 600 light years away. Okay, so a light year is the distance light can go in a year, uh, which is about 6 trillion miles. Right. Um, we have not been able to go very fast with respect to the speed of light at all. Uh, fastest spacecraft we ever met, made was the Parker Solar Probe, and it was only fast because the sun was doing most of the work. Uh, basically, it got closer to the sun than any um, any other probe, and, and whipping close to the sun, that massive gravity source, uh, it can really affect your speed. But uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what, what that was in terms of a fraction of the speed of light. If you could go the speed of light from the point of view of someone on Earth, it would take you 600 years to get there. Uh, wow. We go much, 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 much slower than that. Uh, even the closest star, which is four light years, uh, besides the sun, obviously, um, which is a little over four light years away from Earth, would take millennia to get to with the kind of rockets we have. Uh, never mind, you know, something several hundred times further away than that. Uh, again, I'd have to do math, <laughs> and I could do it to, to come up with an exact answer. Um, but once it, it's pretty straightforward once you have the distance and you have the speed that you're using you can figure out how, how long it would take to get there just keep in mind that you have to do 600 times 6 trillion miles uh as a distance so you're going to be dividing some big numbers yeah. <laughs> space, is, space is pretty big space is mostly empty and and that's why getting getting places is hard that's why we haven't left the solar system um <laughs> yet um, we've got a few more questions coming in, but I want to go back just a little bit to a question someone had earlier, just because I thought it was a fun one. Tina wanted yeah, yeah. to know, um, I believe it was Tina, can a chicken lay an egg in zero G? Ooh, good question. <laughs> if I had to guess, I don't know chicken anatomy, but if, <laughs> if I had to guess, I'd say yes, because I think it's under muscular control. Uh, under, sorry, what kind of control? 
under the control of the chicken's muscles. Oh, muscular control. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so it gets pushed out, much like the way that when we eat food, it gets pushed down the tube by mm -hmm. muscles in our esophagus. So we can eat and drink in zero gravity. Food still gets to our stomachs. I'm guessing that an egg gets shoved out using something similar mm -hmm. to shove it down the tube. Um, and if so, yeah, it can lay eggs in zero gravity. They won't stay in the nest, but uh, <laughs> it'll get out of the chicken's body. That's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever been asked about a chicken in space before. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. <laughs> um, That's amazing. I know, Carrie, Carrie has some chickens. I feel like Carrie would help be able to help us out. Um, okay, let's go back. Some great questions from all of y'all. Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Keenan wanted to know, how many planets do we know about outside of our solar system? Oh, my. Um, I want to say that the total just passed 4,000. Uh, we're learning about more all the time, right? And what we learn about them isn't that much detail compared to what we know about planets in the solar system. We can tell uh, uh, roughly what temperature it is based on how far away it is from its sun. We can tell you how long its year is, and we can tell you how big it is sometimes. Depend um, some uh, one of the more favorite ways of detecting a planet around the sun, a, a, a different star, is waiting for it to pass in front of the star and detecting the slight dip that the shadow makes, uh, kind of like a fly buzzing across your headlight. You know, um, it's it's not much of a dip, but we can still pick it out and we can say, oh yeah, there's a planet there. Mm -hmm. um, so we know they exist, and a very small handful of them have been directly imaged. We actually have photos, uh, but even in those photos, there's just a point of light. Uh, we don't know much about their makeup, um, though we're working ways around that too. Um, and we certainly don't really have a picture like as good as Mars where we can look at it in our picture books and go, oh yeah, I can make out different features on the surface and what have you. Yeah. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that oh, did. Okay. I, and I'm, I'm surprised that's, that's more than I thought we knew about. Um, Bill has a great question too. How do you know when you are at a precise point in space at a particular time, such as a flyby of Pluto? Okay, well, that's a very good question. Um, they have instruments on the space probes themselves to tell them what direction they're pointed in, right? Uh, one of the best ways we have of doing that uh, uses what they call star trackers. It's a camera with a very, very, very small opening. And it knows that when it is pointed at that star, it has to be pointed in a particular direction. And right? it tries to keep that heading as much as, as closely as possible. Um, so we can tell, it can tell what direction it's pointed in based on reference stars. As to where it is, that's kind of a measure of how fast it's going and how long it's been doing that. Uh, and we also use radio signals to constantly update the amount, uh, the amount of distance it's traveled and how fast it's going because the, the signal actually shifts depending on how fast it's going with respect to us. Uh, kind of like the, the, the pitch of a horn or an ambulance siren or whatever appears to change as it drives towards you and as it drives away. Um, or a train as it comes towards you, it sounds different as it's approaching versus when it's leaving. It uh, Signals from spacecraft do that too with the radio signals they send back. Um, so we kind of keep it constantly updated as it's going about where it is. Uh, and as it flies, it's not unusual to make little tiny course corrections along the way. Uh, the, the distances we're talking about are huge, so the amount you need to tweak the path is very, very tiny. But we can still do it with maneuvering jets or, very, or small rockets on board the spacecraft itself. Uh, did that did that answer what you were trying to get at there? I, I think so. I think um, Bill yeah. can let us know if you know if there's more. We have some yeah, clarifying sure. questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we have time for just a couple more questions here. So um, let's see. Back to the number of planets that we know about. Um, do you know about how many we have seen that are in the Goldilocks zone? I don't. I, okay. I know what that is. Imagine that's hard <laughs> to, um, to know if we can't know like what the exact conditions are like on the planet. No, we, we can't know exactly. I mean, um, we know what the Goldi Goldilocks zone of a given star is. That's when it gets enough um, enough light and heat from the star that water can exist in liquid form if conditions are right on the planet. But I have to stress that if conditions are right on the planet, because Venus and Mars, as well as the Earth, obviously, are in the Goldilocks zone of the sun. And 
those places are rather inhospitable to life as we understand it. Uh, Mars gets really, really cold down to hundreds of degrees below zero. It, its atmosphere is terribly thin. Um, Venus on the flip side has a very thick atmosphere, about 90 times thicker than the Earth's, and it's all just about all carbon dioxide. So uh, what that means is that it's basically a greenhouse that traps the sun's light and heat, and it's, it's 900 degrees on the surface. Um, neither one of those would be amenable to liquid water, but Earth has just the right amount of atmospheric pressure and atmosphere made out of the right kind of stuff to keep liquid water sustainable on the surface. And obviously that's, that's critical for life as we understand it. Um, so just because we know there are a certain number of plants in the Goldilocks zone doesn't mean that all of them could bear life. Um, I'd like to be optimistic, but I, we, don't, we don't really have any hard data on how likely it is for a planet in a Goldilocks zone to be able to support life at all. We only have this one solar system where we can look at the planets very, very closely. Um, and honestly, that's one of the reasons we explore them. If we, the, the new rover that's going to Mars is going to be looking for signs uh, and chemical footprints left behind when things fossilize. So, because one of the questions that's come up is, well, Mars doesn't seem to bear life now. Did it ever? Because right. Mars used to be substantially wetter and warmer than it is now. Um, that's, that's worth asking. And it would improve our understanding of how likely it is for planets in Goldilocks zones to support life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. And we're getting so many good questions. Um, well, let me, let me put up my contact information again. Oh, you can yeah, feel free to, was, to email me great. if you want to. Um, feel free to send me questions. I, I love getting questions. That's why I do stuff like this. Because honestly, I would never have thought to ask a question about chicken laying eggs in space before this, right? right. <laughs> People have great questions. They don't have to be about chickens. They, <laughs> they can be about anything. I, I, I'll do my best to understand them. And, and of course, I, I'll also try to answer questions that I can't answer, like uh, how long would it take to get to Kepler-22b? Uh, because I don't want to you know, take everybody's time up with the math. I can actually do the math and show you, OK, this is how we know and how long it would take to get there based on this kind of speed. Um, and hopefully be able to answer the question much more effectively. Yeah, and I mean, I think that even I know that if I watch you like do some math on the, you know, the whiteboard, the virtual whiteboard right now, I probably uh -huh. still wouldn't understand it. But I know that's not true for everyone here. So, yeah, that'd be great yeah. if you if someone asks about, you know, how we find out some of these things, like how far away something is or how long it would take to get there. Then, yeah, that's great that you're giving your your email. Um, yeah. And yeah, so all of you asking questions, I'm so sorry that we don't have time for more of them. Um, but again, feel free to contact Matt and you can also join our programs for the rest of the week. We have some awesome topics and I believe even Matt, are you doing another topic this week? I am. I am. Yeah. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about our plans to return to the moon. Um, awesome. That's has been picking up what they call the Artemis program. And if we cross our fingers, we'll get to the moon by 2024, which is just three years away. So that, that's really kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So we'll drop a link in the chat um, so that you can see all the topics that we have planned. You can register for them if you're not registered already. Um, we're also gonna drop a link into the chat for the survey. Um, we have a survey for all those that are attending you know, our virtual astronomy days, and we'd love to hear your feedback about it. Um, I'm gonna real quick show you how you can grab some um, astronomy gear. Um, right here, we're selling hoodies and t-shirts online, and you can purchase those now. If you're a member, thank you so much. We love, you know, thank you so much for supporting us all the time, um, and you can get a discount on, on this gear if you're a member. Um, and so, yeah, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your expertise. Thank you to our members for supporting us all the time. And thank you again to NC Space Grant. Um, thank you all for coming. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.